Mr. Beer, before we uh, hear evidence this morning, there are just um, some announcements that I'd like to make. The first announcement is to uh, <coughs> report that over the last few months, two of the inquiry's core participants have passed away. Uh, Mrs. Isabella Wall died shortly before Christmas, and Mrs. Lynette Hutchings died more recently. Each of those ladies were core participants, made core participants shortly after the public inquiry was constituted as such. Each of them made a written statement, a written witness statement, and the summary of that evidence was read into the record in Mrs. Hutchings' case on the 10th of March of last year, and in Mrs. Wall's case, the 17th of March, 2022. The evidence demonstrates the hardship which both those ladies suffered. On behalf of the whole of the inquiry team, and on my own behalf, I extend condolences and deeper sympathy to their family and close friends. Mr. Mal Maloney, do you know whether compensation payments were finalized in Mrs. Hutchins' case? <clears throat> Not finalized, sir. Mr. Jacobs, what's the position with Mrs. Wall? Sir, um, the letter concerning interim compensation was in the post at the time of her death, sadly, so she died without ever knowing the sum. And that relates to interim compensation. Can I take it that final compensation has not been determined in her case? That is correct, sir, yes. Yes, thank you very much. The, the second announcement I wish to make relates to a letter which I sent to the department, uh, Bayes, last week, which I copied to uh, the legal representatives of the post office concerning uh, <coughs> the statutory instruments which were published by the government relating to the exemption from taxation for those participating in the overturned historic conviction scheme and the newly constituted group litigation scheme. I queried whether or not such exemptions would in due course apply to those who'd uh, made applications to the historic shortfall scheme. I was hoping for a reply from the department by last evening, but perhaps understandably the department have made a request which I have granted for a short further exten for a short extension to re respond to my letter. Can I simply say at this stage that once that response has been received, I will disclose both my letter and the response to core participants and publish the letters on the inquiry website. And the third uh, announcement I wish to make relates to today's programme. <laughs> Much to my surprise, I managed to get here from South Wales this morning, but I'm told that um, there is further significant snow forecast for this afternoon and this evening. And for peace in the Williams household, therefore, I wish to return before I am marooned. So today's proceedings will cease at 1 p.m. I'm told that that will be sufficient time for Mr. Beer to ask the questions which he wishes to ask of Mr. Dunk. He also tells me that it's um, <clears throat> almost inevitable that Mr. Dunks will be asked to return in later phases of this inquiry. And accordingly, I'm going to ask the core participant representatives to bear with me and reserve their questions for that later time so that I can hopefully get on a train and go back to South Wales. So thank you. Over to you, Mr. Beer. Thank you very much. Uh, may I call Andrew Dunks, please? I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. 
That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Dunks. So as you know, my name is Jason Beer, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Can you tell us your full name, please? Andrew Paul Dunks. Thank you very much for coming to give evidence to the inquiry today and for the provision of your witness statement. In uh, the hard copy bundle in front of you at tab A1, there should be a copy of that witness statement. Yeah, can you open it, please? Yep. Um, it should be an 18-page witness statement dated the 20th of February. Yep. 2023. And if you turn to the 18th page, you should find your signature. Yeah. Is that your signature? It is, yeah. And are the contents of that witness statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? It is, yes. I'm going to ask you questions primarily about um, issues that arise in phase three of the inquiry, albeit there are some references to your engagement in individual prosecutions and the group litigation uh, proceedings where those matters are relevant to the role that you performed um, and the tasks that you undertook, um, which is relevant to phase three of the inquiry. As the chairman has said, we, in any event, it was the intention to recall you in phases four or five of the inquiry. And that's because, as I think you know, you gave evidence in a number of prosecutions and civil claims, including um, those of Josephine Hamilton, Seymour, Seema Misra, and Lee Castleton. Uh, can I start with your background and experience, please? Um, you left school, I think, at the age of 16, is that right? Mm -hmm. And um, you went to college undertaking a training course in electronics, yes. is that right? Yeah. Um, you then worked um, building um, residential extensions, is that right? Mm -hmm. And then um, took another job in installing acoustic vents. Yes. Uh, you tell us in your witness statement that in 1996, a friend who worked for ICL offered to get you a job in desktop computer support. Yes. And did you get that job? I did. And did that job involve providing IT support to ICL employees? Um, yes, it did. You tell us in your witness statement that you had no experience it, uh, at all in that sort of work. Was that correct? Yes. And no qualifications to undertake it, is that right? No, that's right, yeah. Uh, to be clear, though, none of that work involved the post office, Horizon, or the provision of IT support outside ICL, is that correct. right? Correct. Uh, did you carry on... Um, doing that job until 2002, so about six years. Yeah. Uh, you moved to the customer service post office account security team, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, that uh, is sometimes abbreviated to um, CPSOA. CSPOA. CSPOA, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, by that time, 2002, ICL had become Fujitsu. I believe so, yeah. Uh, by that time, um, when you took up um, this new role in the security team, did you know anything about the operation or integrity of the Horizon system? Not at all. I think you were the um, cryptographic key manager for the team. I was. It. Although you were described as a manager, is it right that you um, didn't manage anyone? Correct, yeah. Uh, you um, no, you had no reports to you. Correct. Uh, you uh, say in your statement that you reported to the operational security manager. Mm -hmm. Can you remember who that was, please? Uh, well, at the time of joining, I think it was someone called Bill Mitchell. Bill Mitchell. Yes. And they, in turn, Mr. Mitchell reported to the information security officer? I, yes, I think so. And who was that? I don't know. I, can't, I don't remember. Was the information security officer essentially the head of this department? Um, yes. Uh, where were you based? In Felton. And how many people were in the um, post office account security team? I think at the time about four. 
did you receive any formal training prior to taking up the role? No. Did you ever receive any formal training from Fujitsu? In, in what respect? I, I, I went on a uh, network, call, I did a number of courses within Fujitsu. Uh, what kind of courses? Antivirus course, uh, networks course. And what was the networks course? Um, I can't remember, it was, it was about integrity, oh, not integrity, sorry. Uh, it was about how networks work and IP addresses and things like that. And who was it provided by? I can't remember. Was it internal um, to Fujitsu or did you extend? Uh, did I, think you extend? It was an, I think it was an external company. And how long did it last? It was probably, a day, I think it was a day. Um, was that the nature of the training you got, a, a, sort of a day here and a day there? Yeah. And how many days up until the time, um, say 2016, 2017? I can't remember. Did you have an annual training program? There was an annual training program, but it didn't mean we, we, we took, um, took it up or did any training. It, it, it was there on paper, but it, you, you didn't necessarily always do it. Agreed, yeah. And why was that? There was, it was only went on a training course that was um, specific or a need for it. Can you recall now any formal training that you undertook with Fujitsu that was relevant to your role? Or was it sort of passed into the ether? Relevant, of my, relevant to my role at the time of joining the post office account um, was a handover from the previous um, person who looked after the cryptographic keys. And how long did the handover last? I can't remember. I'll be, I'll be guess, it could have been a week or two weeks. I really can't remember. Did anyone in the um, post office account security team have any formal qualifications in information technology or computer science? I don't know. I can't remember. As you um, sit here now, nobody stands out in your memory as being um, expertly qualified in those disciplines? Not specifically, no, but I believe to become a, uh, a CISO, you have to get a, a qualification, take the qualifications, industry, industry qualifications. What did your job as a cryptographic key manager involve? Basically, it was to refresh the cryptographic encoding keys on the counters of, the, of each branch. And just tell us what a cryptographic key is, please. Um, a cryptographic key encodes the data while it's being tran uh, transferred through the network to the, the, uh, the database or the horizon system. It will encode it in, in, at source in the counter. Uh, it goes through the networks and then will be decrypted at the other end. So it's a secure transfer of data. And those, those keys are refreshed, were refreshed every two years. And so that was the period of periodic refreshment? Yes. And um, how was that done under Legacy Horizon? And do you understand my use of the phrase Legacy Horizon? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the Horizon system before Horizon Online. How, how was it done? That I would have been generated the new keys in a secure room. How did you generate the new keys? On a terminal in the secure room as a piece of software. Yes. Key generation software. And then from the secure standalone PC, they'd be transferred from there onto another PC, which would have been connected to the Horizon system. You and then pause, pause a moment. It looks like something's being said.
can we just pause a moment? I think there's a problem with the transcript. So can I ask you to rise, please, whilst the problem with the transcript is fixed? We'll, um, we can't give a time estimate. We'll come and get you. Yeah. So apologies no, um, no. for the interruption and to Mr. Donk. Uh, you were just telling us about the um, way in which you provided refreshed or updated cryptographic cri keys to um, branches yes, and telling us that you generated them on a standalone um, system um, at the Feltham office. Yes. What happened then? They were... Um, no, the, we, the, it wasn't at the Feltham office, if I remember correctly. It would have been at... Um, oh, actually, I'm not sure. It was either Feltham or Bracknell at the time. Right. Um, once they were generated, they were transferred on a, a cassette um, onto another PC within the room, and that had secure connection to the network, the Horizon network, and that would then push the keys out to the appropriate counters. And how would the counters know um, about their new cryptographic key? I can't remember how that worked. Did they receive a communication separately from that which was pushed out electronically? I can't remember. Did the system change when um, you moved from Legacy Horizon to Horizon Online? Yes, it did. Was this your principal function, cryptogra cryptographic key manager? Yes. You tell us in your witness statement that your role over time expanded to include other um, areas of information technology security. Mm -hmm. Before it expanded into those other areas, did you receive bespoke training in relation to each of the areas? We were given training to be able to do the job we were asked to do, yes. Was that internal to Fujitsu? Yes. I think you mentioned five areas. They are user management, intrusion prevention, processing applications for security checks, performing audit data extractions, and performing transaction reconciliations. Mm -hmm. um, can I look at each of those five roles sure. or functions in turn? Firstly, user management. You tell us in your witness statement, it's paragraph nine, that user management involved maintaining a database of all of the Fujitsu employees with access to the Horizon system. Is yes. that right? Yeah. And how many um, employees, broadly, um, were there within Fujitsu who had access to the Horizon system? Uh, I, I can't remember. Are we I, um, talking five, fifty, five hundred, or five thousand? Oh, in, in the hundreds, yeah. In it could hundred. have been two. It could have been a hundred or two hundred, because not everybody within the post office account had access or log on access to the Ryzen system itself. And were there different levels of access? Yes. Can you describe in broad terms the uh, different levels? Um, it varied from being able, it, it depended on what system they were, that person or support person needed to log on to, uh, and their level of access on what they were able to do on that platform. So it would have been, if I remember correctly, view only or read, and then it went up to like an, an admin level where they were able to log on uh, and fix a problem 
or look at a problem at a, at a higher level on whatever database they had access to. Is that the best of your recollection now? Yeah, it, yeah that's still the same now. I've got to ask you, um, what, what are you doing at the moment? I'm still doing the same, same job, but specifically just the key management. You don't do the other five things that I mentioned? I haven't done for a while, no. And why is that? We, I think our, our team's expanded to sort of seven or eight people. So they're, they're, it's more bespoke and you're looking after your area. Can we look um, at a document, please? Um, FUJ 3008-8036. Can you see that um, this is a document um, entitled Secure Support System Outline Design? It's version 1.0 and it's dated the 2nd of August 2002. Yep. And so um, it's dated at the beginning of your role in um, the Post Office Account Security Team. Would that be right? Yes. And can we um, please look at page 15 of the document, please? And under paragraph 4.3.2, if we can just read the first paragraph and the first bullet together, um, all support access to, to the Horizon systems is from physically secure areas. Individuals involved in the support process undergo more frequent security vetting checks. Other than the above controls, sorry, other than the above, comma, controls are vested in manual procedures requiring managerial sign-off controlling access to post office counters where update of data is required. Otherwise, third-line support has unrestricted and unaudited privileged access system admin to all systems, including post office counter PCs. Did that reflect the position as you understood it, that those in the SSC, the third-line support, had unlimited and unrestricted privileged access to all systems, including post office counter PCs? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't recall the level of actual access that each individual had, although, because we would have given the access asked for and required for their role and signed and asked from their, their, their line manager. Did your team have the function of regulating such access? Only to, to the extent that we gave them the access that was requested. So, yes, you carried it out, yes. i.e. limiting or expanding access? <laughs> um, it was more we got the request for access to yes, a, a system and we would pass on that request to whoever then would set up the access. So we'd, we weren't physically going in and, and editing or, or changing that specific person's um, access. Somebody else within another team would do that. So um, who did you get the request from and to whom did you send it? I can't remember directly who it came from, but it would have been come. It would have come from um, a line manager. There would have been a process in place. A line manager within Fujitsu. Within whoever the that person worked for, would the line be, manager of the person requesting or needing that access. Would it be within Fujitsu or from the post office? Oh no, no, it would be within Fujitsu, the post office account itself. Right. So. And then you would send it to who? We would, I'm trying to think, we would pass it on to the admin team that, that managed NT user accounts. 
at the time, which I believe, if I remember correctly, and I think still is, is uh, a, a support team in Belfast. And why um, was it um, sent through you or your team? So we could keep um, keep records of who's got what access. Or, um, saying not what who's got ac what access, who's got access to systems, not to the level of, of access. It's there they've got a log on. They've been granted permission for a log on, and it's been set up. Was any um, conscious thought or some brain power applied to the request that was coming in? Or did the fact that a line manager had asked for expanded access mean that it was always granted? Um, yes. But, um, no, we were, we, the wonderful word, better word, we were sort of administering that request and passing on for it to be actioned. So it was just an administrative function? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did anyone, to your knowledge, um, apply what I've described as brain power, I think, um, I've had a request in to expand Mr. X's access. The following reasons have been given. I accept or I decline this request. Pass on to the security team to administer. No, that, that wasn't in question because we were... No, we just, we just processed the request. This describes... Um, the third line support having unrestricted and unaudited privileged access, including to um, counter PCs, yes? Yes. In your um, 21 years at um, in performing this function, did you know that? No, because I, I no, I didn't. You, I think, we're, we're going to come on um, perhaps next time to um, discuss, provided a witness statement in High Court proceedings, the Bates litigation, mm -hmm. I think you, you describe it as the group litigation, where you set out in a statement um, 12 control measures. Yep. The purpose of which is this right um, were to ensure or assure the integrity of access to the system? That those 12 controls were the controls put in place when we extracted the ARQ data. They weren't a broader description of um, controls over access to the system more no. generally? No. So they're, they're specifically about the control measures concerning extraction of data? Yes. You also provided, we're going to come to discuss in a moment, witness statements in um, a number of criminal investigations and prosecutions in which you said words to the effect of, I've looked at records of call, um, calls made to help desks and there's nothing in those which leads me to believe that the system was um, operating improperly or... Um, uh, the substance of the cause is relevant to the integrity of the data. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you want to know this kind of information that we're looking at on this page in order to say that kind of thing? No, I wouldn't have needed to know that. That there's a whole class of people who've got unrestricted and unaudited access to a computer system and therefore can make changes to it. My witness statements were purely on, on individual calls logged to the help desk. And I went through each and every of those calls on, on an individual and based my assumption or my, my resolution on, on those specific calls. In the course of your time performing this function, were you aware of any changes made to tighten or restrict access to the third line support, the SSC? I... During that time, I believe there was a um, a project to address or look at levels of or if people had the right um, access w within their their logins. 
and why was there a project to look at whether people had the right levels of access? I don't know. I wasn't involved in it. I just I was aware of it. And um, how were you aware of it? Because um, I think my line manager at the time was was involved in in, in that project. And who was your line manager at the time? <sighs> it's very difficult. We had so many line managers come and go, but I can't remember who specifically was at that time during that project. Can we look at page one of this document, please? And scroll um, down. Um, starting from underneath the word approved in capital letters. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, can you um, run through, please, the people mentioned, starting with uh, Peter Robinson, um, the IPDU security. Sorry, Peter Robinson. Did I say a different word? It's Ian Robin. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I beg your pardon. I was looking further down. Peter Robinson. Mm hmm. Um, what function did he perform? I don't know who he was. Uh, Simon Folks. Again, I don't know who he was. Colin Mills. No. Nope. And then looking at the table, please. Uh, towards the foot of the page, mm -hmm. uh, Ian Morrison. Nope, the only person, <coughs> excuse me, I recognise is, is Mick Peach. And uh, what do you recognise about Mick Peach? He was the, <coughs> excuse me, he was the uh, head of, or, or manager of the SS, SSC's third line support team. And so the, um, the head of the team that we were just looking at that had this unrestricted and unprivileged and unaudited access? If, yes, because it said the SSC, yes, yeah. And um, what dealings did you have, how frequently and of what nature with Mr Peach? Actually, infrequently, actually. And of what, um, t what was the nature of your, what was the purpose of them, what was the reason for them? I can't remember. I can't remember. Uh, can we um, go over the page, please? And scroll down. In that list of um, names, is there anyone that you uh, recognise? Uh, Steve Parker, who was a member of the SSC team. Who and, worked, who, um, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. Who worked for Mick Peach? And... Was your contact with him at the same level as with Mr. Peach? I would probably have spoken to Steve uh, Parker a, a lot more because um, to ask questions or get some information from him. About? Uh, generally about um, the system or, or calls logged or it was a number, a number of different reasons why we, I would have spoken to Steve. Can you outline to us in broad terms in what circumstances you would go uh, and speak to Mr. Peach? Mr. Sorry, Mr. Parker. No, I, I can't remember specifics that I spoke to him. him. It, it would have been support issues and questions or help that we needed at the time. Help about what? About about anything on, on the account, because they were they were a the very knowledgeable about things. Uh, what things? A about the horizon. What about horizon? The workings of horizon. What workings of horizon? Calls that would have been logged that I actually had to look into uh, and uh, for the witness statements. It wouldn't have just been Steve. There were many members of the SSC who we, had, we would have had dealings with. Uh, within the reconciliation process, we would have spoken to the SSC, and that could have been Steve Parker. 
Um, would you just speak to them, or would it be the, your communications be documented in any way? I would say most of the time it was a, a phone call, or I'd walk up to the sixth floor and have a chat. The reason for me asking that you this, just so that you understand, is that you ended up providing witness yeah. in a series of witness statements in a series mm -hmm. of prosecutions, yes. which made certain assertions. Yeah. And we're later going to explore whether those uh, assertions were true or misleading. Mm -hmm. And if tr uh, untrue or misleading, um, what they were based on, what you based your information on. So at the moment, I'm just trying gently to explore where you get your information from. Do you yeah. understand? Mm -hmm. So can you, with that background in mind, tell me a bit more about when and in what circumstances you might go to someone in the SSC? If there was an area within um, calls that we'd passed on to do reconciliation that we didn't quite understand the wording that they'd, they'd, they'd put in within the call. Um, Did you treat them as the subject matter experts in Horizon? Yes, I did. Was there, there anyone else that you treated as a subject matter expert in Horizon? There were a number of different support teams because um, uh, within the, my remit of, of cryptographic keys, um, there were the development team within for cryptographic keys, the audit system, they had a support and development team. So whatever areas we worked in, there would always be like a, a first point of contact we'd go to. Does the SSE stand out in your memory? As oh, yes, yeah, uh, we would have gone through them quite a lot. But the communications you had with them were mainly verbal, either face-to-face -face or on the phone? Yeah. Okay, good. that can come down, please. Um, can we turn to the second um, of the five additional um, roles that um, your job expanded to include? And that's intrusion prevention. And you tell us in paragraph 10 of your witness statement that this involved ensuring that antivirus software was updated appropriately on the Horizon system. Mm -hmm. What was your role specifically in relation to that? Part wasn't heavily involved in that one, but part of that role was to have a look at all the platforms within the Horizon system to see that they've had their virus um, updated, signatures updated. Were you trained to do this? I was trained and shown how to, to do, that, do that, yes. So you were shown how to do it? Yes. And so what did it involve doing? So I said, sorry? What did it involve you doing? We would log on to a piece of software or a platform and that would list um, all the platforms that were taking or being updated with antivirus. And if one hadn't been updated for a period of time, we would con either, I can't remember what we did, either log a call or, or investigate why it hasn't accepted the update and, and got it resolved. And how would you get it resolved? I can't remember. Is somebody in your team still doing this? We're doing ESET updates. I think, I believe so, yes. But you can't remember or, or now don't know? No, it was what, a long time involved. ago that I, I've had involvement in, in the ESET updates or antivirus updates. The way you describe it sounds like an administrative function Again. rather than involving any technical expertise on your Ag part. Is yes. that fair? Yes. Uh, can I turn to the third um, role that you um, say that you performed? which is processing applications for security checks. And you tell us in paragraph 11 of your statement that this um, concerned providing administrative assistance to facilitate the vetting being carried out on new sub-postmasters. Is yes. that right? Yes. What was the nature and extent of the good character checks carried out on sub-postmasters before they were appointed, to your knowledge? I don't know the exact 
what checks were carried out, because that was carried out by um, oh God, the team. It was a security team based on the ground floor. Um, a Fujitsu team or a post office team? Fujitsu team. And so there was a team on the ground floor, a security team carrying out um, what I've described as character checks, good character checks? Yes. On sub postmasters? Yes. And why were Fujitsu carrying out the character checks on sub postmasters? I have no idea. Do you know um, what those checks involved? No, I'll be guessing. You tell us in your statement that your role was processing applications for security checks. What um, did that involve, your role, processing the applications for security checks? It would have been receiving, if I remember correctly, because this stopped quite a long time ago, we would have received a, an email application from the post, uh, post office, uh, including... Um, photographic ev evidence of passports uh, and I, I can't remember what else I, I remember passports we would pass all the information of, of that applicant down to Fujitsu security uh, they would then carry out whatever checks financial background I don't know checks to them for them if it most of the time it came back okay nearly all the time it came back down. I can't recall one that didn't they would then come back say yes all good we would then request a pass to be created uh, with the sub postmaster's photograph and name and i think a unique id number we would get that and then send put it in the post to the post office uh, you said that you can't recall a um, a check ever coming back as a negative, meaning that it couldn't be Been regressed. Refused. Yeah, no, I don't remember. At this time, say between 2000 and 2015, so uh, admittedly you only came into role in 2002, were you aware in general terms that some postmasters were being prosecuted for criminal offences? Yes, I was aware. Yeah, I think the answer must be yes, because you provided witness yeah, statements yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 to help yeah. to prosecute them. Yeah. Were you aware of the numbers involved of the prosecutions? No. Was there any ever con any conversation in the office? I mean, we know now that between, I think, the year 2000 and 2015, there were about 850 prosecutions um, brought, resulting in over 700 convictions. I wasn't aware of, of, of numbers, no. Was there any conversation in the office that you heard about? No. That we're putting all these people through these good character checks, they're all coming back okay, and then they're turning out to be people who um, no. engage in criminal conduct? No, I don't recall any conversation along those lines. So it wasn't coming back down the line that, that a large number of our sub-postmasters are criminals? No. Again, this sounds like you were just performing an admin function. Would that be fair? Correct. And is that why you might not know about the bigger picture that I'm describing, namely looking at the whole data set, how many prosecutions there have been, how many people are being convicted, despite these character checks we're carrying out on these people? Yeah, correct. I'm unaware. Uh, the fourth um, task that you mention, or role that um, you mention, is performing audit data extractions. And you tell us in paragraph 12 of your witness statement, this involved responding to audit um, record queries, ARQs. Mm -hmm. And um, is that what you understood the acronym ARQ to stand for, an audit record query? Yes. And would a, um, an ARQ, a, a query, refer to a common data set, or would there be subsets within it, the, the request? No, there were specifically 
requesting specific. So if somebody said, give me the, the ARQ for um, this post office branch, that would be an absurd request. They would have to say within this date range and this type of data. Correct. Uh, were you um, aware of um, any difference between credence data, ARQ data, raw data, and enhanced ARQ data? Uh, no. Uh, do you understand what credence data is? Do you understand the reference to credence data? No, I've heard of credence data, but I didn't know what it was. In what context had you heard of credence data? I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, had you um, heard a reference to raw data? No. Had you heard any reference to enhanced ARQ data? No. You tell us um, in paragraph 12 of your witness statement how ARQ extractions were um, uh, carried out. And we've heard some evidence in the inquiry from um, Gail Peacock to the effect that part of the contract between the post office and Fujitsu included um, the provision of an agreed number of ARQ files that could be requested free of charge. Correct. Um, or, or without specific charge. Um, is that something that you knew about? Yes. Uh, but that if the post office exceeded uh, the ceiling of the permissible requests for um, ARQ data, then there was a charge to be levied to the post office. Did you know about that? Yes. What did you understand about the nature of the charge if they exceeded the ceiling of permissible requests? I don't know. I wasn't involved in, in those conversations. D did you under, um, had you heard of a figure of £400, for example? No. Okay. What was the annual limit to your understanding of the permissible number of um, ARQ requests that could be made by the post office without incurring specific individual charges? I can't remember specifically because that, that number went up over the years. It, it either started below or above 700, 750, I can't remember. 700 or? 750. And can you recall how many requests were made uh, within the, that ceiling? No. And then above that ceiling, if it was exceeded, for which no, a charge was made? I can't remember. Uh, presumably, there was a record kept of the number of requests that were made to your team so that Fujitsu would know yes. whether the ceiling was being yes. reached or... Not. Well, the ARQs had a specific number, so it started on the 1st of April as ARQ1, and it incrementally went up during the year. And so the number of the ARQ itself would tell you whether you had exceeded the or they had exceeded the ceiling or not? Correct. And can you recall... Um, in your years working, um, performing this um, extraction function, how frequently the post office exceeded the ceiling? I can't recall, no. Were you aware of um, any of the other commercial arrangements between the post office and Fujitsu for the provision of ARQ data? No. Such as turnaround times? There were SLAs for certain amounts of data that were requested, yes. And can you help us with those? I can't remember what they were. It may have, sorry, I can't remember, but I would be guessing that some were, it, it depended on the number of days requested, how long we had to extract it and return it to the post office i.e. The, the size of the data sets that Correct. you were asked to harvest yep. affected the um, timeliness of the provision of it. Uh, that's what I remember, 
Yes. Can you recall anything else about the commercial arrangements between the post office and Fujitsu? For example, whether the provision of witness statements was included within the price that the, um, for which no. no additional fee was levied, or no. whether a witness statement came at a cost? I have no idea, no. Is that because you now can't remember, or it wasn't something that you would ever have known about? I don't believe I ever knew the cost or charges that, that, that Fujitsu had with post office. You were the person, as we'll come on to discover, that was actually providing the witness statements mm -hmm. about the extraction of data. Yes. How you gone about it, um, what it consisted of, and what you thought it showed. Yes. Were, were there never any discussions about um, uh, how much Fujitsu was earning from uh, this function and therefore the work that you put into it? No, never. Was there any limitation ever put on the work that you um, uh, put into the investigatory activity that you carried out before providing a witness statement? No. So they, they didn't say, we're getting X pounds, Fujitsu are getting X pounds for providing this witness statement, and therefore you should only spend Y time doing the work? No, not at all. No, I never heard of that. I, that was never a discussion. So you could spend as much time as was necessary in order properly to research the issue that you were being asked to address in the witness statement before providing the witness oh, statement? Oh, definitely. I would have needed as much time as I need, needed to understand the nature of the call. It, it's correct, isn't it, that um, in broad terms, ARQ data was branch data that related to all of the keystrokes on the system that somebody in the branch had undertaken? Not keystrokes. That probably was part of the, the, the data. It was more the transaction and what was paid for, what was and how much each transaction. It, it was an insight into um, what tasks were being undertaken in branch, uh, what the end user was doing uh, on the system and when. Yes. And so it was a good window, a good insight into what was going on in the branch. I would say so, yes. You tell us in your witness statement that the requests for ARQ um, data would specify the branch, the date range, and the data type to be extracted. Is that right? So the, the, the branch, the date range, and the data type to be extracted. Not the data type. It just would have been the, the data within that date range. Just look at um, WITN 0030-0100. Please, and look at page three. And look at paragraph 12 at the bottom. And look at the third line. Um, if this could be highlighted, please. Each ARQ would <coughs> specify the relevant post office branch, date range, and then and data type to be extracted. <coughs> That's where I got that from. The data type would have been the, the transactional data. Um, I don't understand what you're uh, meaning by saying R, ah, but it would have been the transactional data. Um, can you it, explain, please? They request the request on the ARQ would have been the it, the archived transactional data, and that's the data type. So, what different specifications could there be for data type? There wouldn't have been in that I recall. So, why did each ARQ need to specify the data type to be extracted if there was only one type? I don't know. What was the purpose of, I mean, where did this appear on the form or the document? Data type to be extracted, and then it would always say the same thing. 
I can't remember if it specifically said this type, this data type. Can you just explain what you were meaning then in um, uh, this sentence in your witness statement? Each ARQ would specify dot, 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 the data type to be extracted. It, that would have meant that, the, that they were after, the ARQ meant that yeah, they were after the, the um, transaction data. That's my meaning of that. Was it explained on the request, that can come down now, thank you, uh, the purpose to which the ARQ data that had been requested was to be put? So I say again? Yeah, was it set out on the request? Was it explained on the request? The purpose to which the data that had been asked for was going to be put? No. What did you understand the purpose to which the data that you were being asked to provide was going to be put? they would, would be using it for investigation of any type. What do you mean investigation of any type? Uh, investigating any fraud that was possibly going on. That was my understanding. So you knew that it was about a fraud investigation? Yes. There wasn't um, a field on the request form that said this is for X purpose or Y purpose? Not that I remember, no. Was the request filled in by someone in Fujitsu or the post office? The post office. And how did you receive the request? Via email in a standard form? Yes, or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. yeah. It would have come, sorry, it would have come to the, the, the CSPOA security team had a shared um, email account and that would have come into that account uh, asking for, can you please supply the attached data? And the, the attached would have been the ARQ in a Word document. Right. So. <coughs> That would be an email directly from somebody in the post office? Yes. And the attached Word document, was that a pro forma? When you say pro forma? A template document? Yes. And whose template document was it? Is that no a Fujitsu one or a post office one? I have no idea who, who origina where it originated from. But that template document would have fields in it which said uh, post office branch, um, data sought from this date to that date? Yes. Were there any other fields in the template document? Trying to remember, there, was, there were ones where, which asked whether uh, HSD call, hardware calls were required. Um, Just explain to us what um, that additional request might, um, why that additional request might be made because they wanted to see um, what calls, help desk calls were logged at that particular branch between that date, at that date range. And so that was an add-on, was it? That wasn't always requested? Correct. So that might be specifying the type of data sort. Just thinking back to your witness statement. Yes, I suppose it could, yes, yeah. Yes, um, please continue. Are, are there any other types of um, add-ons, as I've called them, that might be specified on the template? There were whether a witness statement was re required, yes or no. Yes. Um, within, oh God, I think there was a section of any other, I'd like a, any additional, and they would possibly sometimes spe specify a specific um, transaction or can you find or highlight um, a transaction that took place on a certain day for a certain amount of money? Um, that, again, would be another request within the, on the ARQ form. So a much more targeted request? Yes. Anything else? 
can't remember anything else, no. Were you told within the um, request form whether the audit um, extraction sort, the product of it, was to be used for similar, civil or criminal litigation purposes? I don't think, it, no, I don't think so. The request for a witness statement might give a clue to that, mightn't it? Oh, sorry. Yes, quite probably not, sorry, yeah. Yeah, if it was requesting a, a witness statement, yes. Was there any difference in the way that you went about harvesting the data sought or the means by which you supplied it if you knew it was going to be used for those purposes, criminal or civil litigation? None whatsoever. There wasn't an additional standard applied or different steps undertaken? No. It was all the same? Yes. And when were you first asked to perform these audit extractions? I couldn't tell you. I joined, as I said, 2002. Um, somebody else was running ARQs at the time. I may have done some in 2002 or 2003 if, someone, if that person was on... There was only one person doing the ARQs at the time. And who was that? I can't remember her name. Um, and I, th I can't tell you the exact date of my very first ARQ that I ran. And was that person, the, the lady you can't remember the name of, the person that gave you the, the sort of the on-the-job introduction to how to do this? Yes. Was there anything more developed or involved than that? No, no, there were, there were, no. And who was your boss at this time? I can't remember at the time who my boss was when I joined. Why did um, you take over, or your role, expand to include this function? <laughs> I think it was because that person left. And how, what, what did you think of the task that you were being asked to perform? What do you mean, what did I think about did, it? Did you um, think on the one hand, this is um, data extraction, it's a process-driven function, I get a request in, I type into a computer the information sort, and then I pass it on? Correct. Or did you think I'm performing an important function, the data which I produce may be used in criminal prosecutions, which prosecutions may seal the fate of an individual sub-postmaster? It would have been the first. So did you have any sense or idea of the significance of the function that you were performing? The significance was that we were extracting the, the data and it had to be um, the, the exact data that was requested, so it was what they, they, they required. N no more, they, they hadn't. So you, you had to get the date range right? We had to get, yes, we had to get the, the data that they requested um, was correct and, and pass it on, yes. Uh, can we look, please, in, in fact, um, that might be an appropriate moment for the, um, the morning break. Could we take a slightly shorter break? Yes, of course. Um, and maybe come back 25 past, please? Certainly, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Dunks, can we look, please, at Fujitsu's four zeros, two treble zero? This is, um, you'll see from the title, a service description for the security management service. It's dated the 6th of uh, March, 2006. It's version three. And then if we just scroll forwards to page three of the document, uh, the first uh, box at the top of the page, issued for information, 
please restrict this distribution list to a minimum. You are one of the people to whom it was distributed. Yes. I'm going to um, use this document because it provides a, um, a description of some of the data that could be requested and provided on an ARQ and other request. And can we um, go, please, to page 11 of the document and um, go to beyond halfway down to paragraph 3.10. And you'll see that there are some um, definitional sections. Um, I'm not too worried about the purpose to which these were put, but I just want to see whether you recognize the distinctions that are being drawn in this um, description of the security management service of which you were a part. You will see, firstly, um, there's a defined term, banking transaction record query means a record query in respect of a banking transaction which the data reconciliation service has reconciled or has reported as an exception, the result or records of which are subsequently queried or disputed by the post office or a third party. And then an audit record query, an ARQ, means a record query which is not a banking transaction but which relates to transactions. Do you um, recognize the distinction that's being drawn between those two things? Uh, yes, I think so, yes. Would you sometimes receive requests for banking transaction record queries and sometimes re receive requests for um, ARQ, um, audit recovery queries? I don't recall or remember them being a distinction on the ARQ form. Uh, can we uh, continue and look at um, old data? You see old data is defined as meaning the extraction of records created before the 3rd of January 2003, but not earlier than the 18th of May 2002, before which data was automatically deleted. Just stopping there, um, does that um, ring a bell with you? Does that accord with your recollection that there was a, um, a time at which data was automatically deleted from the system? Yes. And can you remember what the period of deletion was and whether it was uniform across all data sets? My recollection that was six or seven years. This document was being written in March 2006. And it suggests that data um, just under four years old had been automatically deleted. Your recollection is different. No, my recollection is when I knew it was being there was a deletion was I think it was six or seven years at the time of this I wouldn't have known that it was being deleted and why was that in what circumstances did you come to know about the automated deletion of data later on in years when we were requesting or oh, we got an ARQ and uh, the date range included and it came back and there was no data that part of that data was, say, missing, there weren't any transactions for certain dates, Th then I, I, I inquired the missing data and then was informed that it's gone past the uh, date it's of deletion. I understand, I think. Um, <laughs> it, it continues um, in the third line of old data relating to transactions other than banking transactions meeting the search criteria. And search criteria is itself a defined term. If we go over the page, please, <coughs> and scroll down. Search criteria means in the case of an audit record query, you remember it distinguished earlier by saying audit record queries are not um, banking transaction record queries. 
Search criteria means A, dates or dates not exceeding 31 consecutive days, branch, fad, and pan, or equivalent identifier, or date or dates not exceeding 31 consecutive days, and branch, fad code, or in the absence of a fad code, the full branch postal um, address. And so uh, can you remember what a branch um, fad or fad code was? That, I don't know what fad stood for, but it was the unique branch code. It was a unique identifier that related to an individual branch? It, yes. Would it relate to an individual counter on a branch or no. the branch as a whole? Branch as a whole. Thank you. And PAN? PAN is the unique... Um, I can never remember what it was because it was a it's a more written statement. It was the unique number associated to a, I believe, a, a credit card. A credit card? A, yeah, a card used for payment. So um, was that one of the search criteria that you were provided with? Yes, it was, yes. Yes, because within the ARQ, where it was asking for certain transactions for certain amounts, they would then ask for, if it was there, for the, the, the PAN number to be supplied as well. Do you think PAN might refer to a primary account number? Yes, sorry, yeah. Um, rather than a credit card? Yes, I wouldn't fully, yes. Yes, it, it was. Uh, we always associate it with a, a card number. I don't know why. And so the account number would be what of the sub-postmaster? No. Uh, I believe it's the person who making the payments... The, cu the customer? Yes. Okay. Uh, does this section here, looking at the specification of what the search criteria um, should be reflect your understanding of how ARQ data was extracted? Yes. You tell us in paragraph 12 of your witness statement that the person undertaking a search would log on and enter the parameters you describe them as. Would the parameters be the search criteria here? Yes. Yes? Yes. Could audit data be extracted for a, a date period longer than 31 days? Yes, it could, but they would have been split up into individual ARQs. An ARQ would have been a month's worth of data. So if they wanted two months of, AR, uh, of data, it would have been two ARQs. And so... If a search period exceeded a 31-day consecutive uh, date period, that would count as a multiple request for the purposes of charging the post office? I believe so. I, as, as I said, I wasn't aware of, of charging the post office. I just knew we were allowed. We had a, a, a set finite number of ARQs to process. So I wouldn't have known it, how much one was or two was being charged. I didn't believe that we were charging on an individual, I wasn't aware we were charging on an individual basis. I think we, they were charged for the total. And if they used that total or were below that total, that we were still being charged Oh, they were still being charged that, that set amount. That's my belief. So if a, um, a single ARQ request came in seeking to extract data for a period of years, would that be um, chunked up by you into a, um, a series of ARQs, each for a 31 period? 31-day period? We wouldn't have chunked it up. The post office were aware that we only did that in 31 days, so they would have supplied um, 
the ARQ numbers to represent the, the, the amount of days. And so if ARQ data was sought for, say, a two-year period, post office would know that they would need to put in 24 ARQs. Yeah. And did that happen, that you would have ARQ requests for a considerable period of time, a number of years? Yes, that did happen, yes. And how frequently um, did that happen? What, what was the, the typical period for which you were asked to extract data? <laughs> did it, was it generally a, um, a period within a month, or was it generally multiple months? It varied. It could have been two days, or a day's worth of data. It could have been two months, six months, or a year. It, it, it varied each time. Can we look at um, page 13 and um, the table on it, please? This, I think, sets out um, the limits of queries, um, both um, ARQs and banking transactions um, in successive um, tables. And can you see the way that the table is constructed? Along the top are the limits on banking transaction record queries. And I think you said you weren't aware of those coming in as a, a species of, of on their own. I couldn't remember that those coming in as, as no. And therefore, if we look on the right-hand side, limits on audit record queries carried out by security and risk for the post office. Um, and the limit and target times, subject to another paragraph, the limit per year shall be the first of the following to be reached. Um, 720 ARQs consisting of old or new data or APOP voucher queries. Can you remember what APOP voucher queries were? It's a defined term in the document. I just wanted to see whether... I don't know what... AP I can't remember what APOP stood for. Did you ever um, conduct such queries, as far as you can remember? I may have done, I can't remember. In any event, um, 720 in a, uh, a year or um, 15,000 um, uh, query days. Can you remember that approach, a query day? That's a defined term, meaning each date against which an audit record query is raised. I don't remember that being a limit. And then um, the limit per month, allowing a burst rate of 14%. Do, do you remember that, a discussion of a burst rate of 14%? No. Nope. Nope. So the limit per month shall be the first of 100 ARQs, of which not more than 10 shall be APOP voucher queries, or 2,100 query days, subject to the constraints on the uh, agreed annual limits above. Do, do you remember the, that? No. Did any of this that I'm showing you now affect the way you carried out your work? No. You just got a query in and you did it? Yes. Is that a yes. fair way of describing yeah. it? Um, would you again see your role as um, um, a, an administrative one? Yes. The 720 sounds like something that you were familiar with because you mentioned it earlier. Yeah. Did that ever change over time? I recalled it going up, but I can't recall what, going, what it went up to. And what did you understand the purpose of the limitation to be? That's what we were contracted to do. That was the limit. But did you understand it was about money, essentially? No. No, I didn't. Well, yes, because that's what they paid for, 720 queries. So, yes, it was about money. And so did you know that if you, they went above that, um, there would be additional money needed to change hands? 
I don't recall because I wasn't involved in any of those sort of discussions at that le that that level. Uh, can we turn on, please, to page fifteen of the document and look at the bottom of the page under paragraph three point ten point eight um, uh, litigation support we just read it together, where the post office submits an audit record query or old format query at post office's request, Fujitsu shall, in addition to conducting that query, A, present records of transactions extracted by that query in either XL95, XL97, or native flat file format as agreed between the parties. Does that ring a bell? The Excel does, but not the native flat file format. I wouldn't know what that was. So did the um, extractions always occur in Excel? That I recall, yes. Uh, over, the, over the page, please. B, subject to the limits below, analyze the appropriate Fujitsu service, services help desk records for the date range in question, branch non-polling reports for the branch in question, and fault logs for the devices from which the records of transactions were obtained. So the request that came in on the template document, would that specify uh, which of these um, three things the post office wanted you to do? I only recall the, the first one, which was the help desk calls. Did you ever do the second or third things? Not that I remember, no. Would you know how to do the second and third things? No. And so the template document did that include these things and they weren't ticked or they were crossed through? I can't remember, actually. So the request didn't come as in a batch lot, essentially, saying, please do all of these things. You no. were only ever asked to analyze the appropriate Fujitsu services help desk records for the date range in question. No, it wouldn't have said analyse. It would, it would have said, um, please supply the help desk calls. But there's a difference between the supply of a record of something and an analysis of it, isn't there? Yes. Where did you uh, get the understanding from that your duty was limited to um, the supply of existing records rather than the analysis of them? from our training that we had and from our, our management team. Uh, who g gave you the training? When was that given? For audit retrieval, it would have been the, the person who was running it at the time I joined the, the, the team. So the, the, the lady whose name you yeah. can't remember yes. yeah. gave you some on-the-job training? Yeah. And you said your managers, can you remember any conversations or discussions with them as to whether your job was just to supply the records of help desk calls or whether you needed to conduct an analysis of them, i.e. to set out what they showed in your view? That wasn't a request at, that was never a request unless it was a specific request from, from the, uh, the post office security team. And how would the post office security team make such a specific request? On the ARQ form. And so when the post office security team made a specific request to analyse, that was identified on the form? N no. Again, the, the form would have said, can you please supply, I don't know the exact wording, but it was basically supply a list of all the help desk calls in that date range. And so did you never understand that it was your role um, to analyse the data that you were supplying? 
it wasn't a specific role, but that's a, a, a something I undertook later on. When, Why did you when, undertake it later on? Because we had a request for a statement for analysis of those calls. So it was only when you were asked to provide a witness statement did you analyse the data that you were providing? Correct. So does it follow that, save where there was actually a prosecution or civil proceedings afoot, i.e. it had got to that stage, the post office never asked you to analyse the data that you were providing to set out what it showed? Yes. What kind of litigation did you think the witness statements were being used for? For, I think I said earlier, it was for prosecutions. Did you know about civil proceedings? No. I didn't, wouldn't know what the difference was. If we carry on reading, the, the third thing um, under the heading litigation support, um, if the post office submitted an ARQ, then Fujitsu shall, in addition to conducting that query, uh, C, in order to check the integrity of records of transactions, extracted by that query, uh, request and allow the relevant employees of Fujitsu services to prepare witness statements of fact in relation to that query to the extent that such statements are reasonably required for the purpose of verifying the integrity of records provided by audit record query or old format uh, query and are based upon the analysis and documentation referred to in this paragraph uh, 3.10.8. The um, contractual requirement or the um, uh, Fujitsu's own description of it is um, in some cases to provide a witness statement of fact when you were providing witness statements, did you understand the distinction between a witness statement of fact and a witness statement that provided opinion? Yes. Did you consciously limit your witness statements to statements of fact? So, sorry, say it again? When you provided witness statements, did you consciously limit them to include only statements of fact? No, because I, I supplied two different types of witness statements. And what were the two different types? The one regarding ARQ data and one regarding help desk calls. And for ARQ data, was that a statement of fact? Yes, it was. Was that really producing records? Yes. For the um, uh, other species of witness statement, did that include statements of opinion? Yes. And when you were making those witness statements, you realised that you were doing something different from the first type of witness statement? I believe so, yes. Was that ever the, um, a discussion point between you and other people in the team or your managers? No, I don't believe so, no. Uh, what, um, I'm speaking in general terms here at the moment, what um, differential level of analysis and investigation did you undertake when you were providing a witness statement that included opinion? So, sorry, can you read? Yeah. So, yeah. What, what difference of approach did you have when you were, if any, when you were providing a witness statement that included opinion? The different approach I would have taken was, was to fully understand the information that was listed and so I could make that judgment of opinion. 
and what analysis would you therefore undertake when you were providing these statements of opinion? I would have looked at each, because these, these referred to individual calls to the help desk, so I would have analysed each and each of the calls on an individual basis um, using what knowledge or, uh, or tools I had at, to my that I could um, have. Did you ever speak to anyone when you were providing that opinion? Yes. Who would you speak to before you provided the opinion in the witness statements? To get a clear understanding of the call, I would either, if I didn't need an opinion, and, I, and to my knowledge of the Horizon account, I would have based that on my, my knowledge of the account and, and the Horizon system. I would either, then if it, I would have spoken to um, a member of the team. Which the, team? The security operations team. So your colleagues in, yes. the, in the four or five growing to seven or eight? Yeah, yeah. Um, I would have looked at the detail specifically for that help desk call, or all, all the text and uh, everything contained within it. Uh, and I would, another option would be to speak to the SSE to gain their knowledge around what's happening on the call. They were the people whose actions were recorded in the, um, the records of the help desk call? Yes. So you'd go back to the people whose documents you were looking at? Sorry? You'd go back to the SSC? Yes, I mean, most of the, say most, I think that all of the calls were dealt with by the SSC. So I would have spoken to them to get a clearer understanding so I could, un I could make my judgment on that particular call. And did anyone um, give you any um, instruction or guidance as to what you should include in your witness statement that reflected the background work that you undertook before you wrote the witness statement? Sorry, say, say that yeah. again. Sorry. Did you receive any guidance or um, instruction about including in the witness statement a narrative of what investigatory work you had undertaken? No. Who you'd spoken to? No. So does it follow that you just decided to do what you thought you needed to do and that was best? Well, the because when, when we look at your witness statements, you'll mm -hmm. see, we'll yeah. see that the, th the thing that you're describing is all dealt with in a single sentence, essentially. Yes. And it's pretty much the same sentence in each witness statement. What I would have based my witness statement, the, the first one that I'd actually did was again would have been a request of help desk calls uh, logged from that branch. I would have then, which where I was coming from was to enable the post office to understand what type of calls those calls were logged, that were logged involved, and what type of call it was. And that's what I was. I was my witness statement and the details were about. We'll see in, a, um, in due course that you include a sentence in the witness statement when you're dealing with the calls to the help desk along the lines of none of these calls to the help desk relate to faults that would have had an effect on the integrity of the information held on the system. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yes. Was that taken from your predecessor's production of witness statements? I believe so, yes. And so w were you using a wording that had been sort of passed on uh, like some oral tradition from one person yes, to, it would to have the been next? A, yeah, there would have been a template to use. And, and no one said to you, when you say that kind of thing, you really need to say what work you've done to reach that opinion, who you've spoken to, no. what they've told you, and the extent to which it affected your opinion? 
No. You just thought you, so, so long as I am of that view, I can reprint the standard line. Yes, because that's what I, I believed at, at the time. Now, you seem to have provided um, witness statements in many of the um, cases involving sub-postmasters and many of the significant cases um, which this inquiry is going to look at. Did you undertake more of this uh, litigation support role than anyone else in the um, security team? No, that was really run. The litigation support side of it was run by uh, a colleague, uh, Penny Thomas. And when you say the litigation support was run by Penny Thomas, what do you mean by run? She controlled or, or managed what went on. Was she a manager of you? No. Was she the same level or grade as you? Uh, yes. And so... It was just her job function to manage. Yes. And so um, how did it come about that you appear to have provided many witness statements or involving significant cases that this inquiry is looking at? I don't know, actually, because I, I believe I was running, doing ARQs before Penny joined the team. And then majority of, of ARQs, I wouldn't say ARQs, anything to do with litigation would have been picked up by, by Penny Thomas. Was it just the pair of you that provided witness statements? Or was there anyone else in the team to your recollection? I think it was just the two of us. Did you have any contact with anyone from uh, the post office's legal division about uh, what it was permissible or impermissible to say in a witness statement? I had no, no contact like that at all, no. Were you aware of the post office making ARQ requests for the purposes of deciding whether or not to prosecute a sub-postmaster in a criminal court? No. Were you aware that the post office um, was not requesting ARQ data prior to or when prosecuting some sub-postmasters in relation to their shortfalls? Did I say it? Yeah. Were you aware that they were proceeding with prosecutions without having first asked for ARQ data? No, no I wasn't. No, I wasn't aware. Were you aware of any discussions within your team about that? No. They're going ahead with prosecutions without having come to us first, asking for ARQ data? No, I would, no. Can we look, please, at uh, Fujitsu 3095195? If we just look at the whole page first so we can capture um, Mr. Simpson's um, name and his signature block. Uh, can you recall Alan Simpson, a security incident senior in post office operations in Ashford? I, re I remember. I, yeah, there was an Alan Simpson. Yeah. I, and what was your understanding of um, Mr. Simpson's role? that he worked in the uh, post office security team. Your team was described um, in some documents as the security team. Was this different then? I don't know what their, the workings or what their security team did. Anyway, he's um, emailing you on the 12th of April 2010 under the subject monthly incident log for March 2010 and has attached... Um, uh, a spreadsheet called incident log and says hi Andy attached is the incident log for um, last month 32 calls and he gives the references I've tried to find closing details for as many as I can 
but the following ones are awaiting updates from Fujitsu. And then he sets them out, including 642, Horizon, alleged system integrity issues. Can you see that? Yes. And uh, ends his list. Could you please chase these ones up, and I'll see you on Friday. Uh, can you assist um, uh, what Mr. Simpson was asking you to do by following up these incidents? I can't remember exactly what that was about. What's the, was this a regular occurrence, an incident log for the previous month I sent don't to you by Excel spreadsheet? I don't remember an incident log. He says that he's going to come and see you. Was that a regular occurrence? I don't remember meeting him. The mention of an, um, an alleged Horizon system integrity um, uh, issue. Mm -hmm. Do you remember those being raised with you? No, I mean, from this, I would take that he, he's asking for updates on those particular calls. I, would, I wouldn't have had any dealings with the calls. I think I would have gone and asked for an update with who's ever dealing with the call. Uh, what, which area of your five roles is this concerned with then? Which one of your five <laughs> roles is this about? Um, I can't remember. As I say, I don't remember the, the, this, this type of email or the email. So I, I don't know which role that, that fitted in. But the, the calls would be from who to who? 32 calls. These are the reference numbers. The only calls that I remember were... Uh, peak calls. So these could be referencing peak calls. And w in what respect would they need following up? They may have not actually been resolved yet. And why would it be your function to resolve them? Oh, I wouldn't have resolved them. I, was chase I would have chased up whoever's dealing with those calls. I would, I would have asked for an update. Why was it your function to chase up unresolved peak calls? At the time, I have, I, I have no idea. If you, uh, did you have access to peaks? Yes. And therefore, to take 642, if the description of this is um, uh, correct, uh, system um, integrity issue with Horizon, you'd be aware from being able to look at that call that an issue had been raised about the integrity of the Horizon system? If I wanted to, yes. Would you want to? I, hadn't, I probably wouldn't have had any need to. I, I would have probably passed this... Um, on to um, whoever, if, if they were peak calls and they were being dealt with by the SSC, I would have put a chase on members or, or, or the SSC for an update on those calls. But wh why is um, somebody in security speaking to you when um, and emailing you to chase up something that rests with the SSC? I think because we had a, a dialogue between, I don't think he had access or, or contacts within, I'm only assuming here, that within the SSC. In your witness statement, you suggest that you had limited knowledge of the technical operation of Horizon. Yes. And less still knowledge of any bugs, errors, or defects in the system. Mm-hmm. Yes? Yeah. Um, you explain... Um, in paragraph 19, that aside from your limited role in the transaction reconciliation process, you had no role in the investigation of errors reported by the system or by system users. Correct. Uh, you um, explained that you didn't work in the help desk and had no role within it. Yes? Yes. And you say that on occasion you were requested to provide the post office with records of call made by the help desk by a particular post office branch and if requested to summarize these in witness statements as paragraph 20 of your witness statement is that right that's correct was your role a purely procedural administrative or mechanical one therefore mm -hmm. you describe in that paragraph that your um, role if requested was to summarize the calls in a witness statement our discussion earlier um, suggests that you went further than that, that you analysed 
the calls and offered an opinion about the calls. Is that fair? Yes. But why in paragraph 20 of your witness statement did you say that your role was to summarise? Well, that, to summarise, my understanding is, summar, is to summarise the calls, and but part the part of the witness statement is um, the wording of of the witness statement. The summarisation is of the calls, not the of not the wording of the of the witness statement. Can I um, try and understand what you mean there? Um, you said that um, if you were just asked to provide ARQ data mm -hmm. and nothing more, you wouldn't analyse it, you would just provide it? Yes. If you were asked, however, to provide a witness statement, you would analyse it? If the witness statement... No, if I uh, analyse the help desk calls. Yes. Yes. And you would offer an opinion about it, you agreed earlier. Yes. That's different from providing a summary of it, isn't it? Not that I understand, no. A summary would have been a, an overview of each call. But you and went further than that, didn't you? Yeah, but based on that summary, I, I made a, a statement. Were you trying to minimise your role in this paragraph? No, not at all. Were you trying to paint the picture in the, your, the witness statement that your role was a purely procedural, administrative or mechanical one? Not really, no. Do you believe that you had the uh, qualifications, experience and technical understanding to offer an opinion as to whether um, issues raised in help desk calls that you were analysing went to the integrity of the Horizon system? Based on my investigation or using due diligence for each call, I would have based my, that statement on my knowledge and understanding. What was the due diligence that you conducted? As I think I said earlier, it would have been my current knowledge of the Horizon, um, speaking to members of the security team, looking at the peak itself and going through the peak and the wording and, the, and what was done to resolve that peak. And if needed, I would have spoken to a member of the SSC to clarify what was going on. But you wouldn't maintain a record of all of those things that you did? No. And you wouldn't explain them in the witness statement itself? No. So that the reader wouldn't know um, what background work or homework you'd undertaken in, in order to offer the opinion that you were offering? No. Did you ever feel uncomfortable about doing this? No, I didn't, no. Because I believed at the time, when I wrote that statement, I believed th the wording, and I was happy I wouldn't have signed it otherwise. Can we um, uh, look, please, at um, Fujitsu triple zero eight o two one five? Can we um, see the? Um, date of this document at the foot of the page, please. The 14th of June, 2011, and it's version two. And then look at the top of the page, the title of the document. Um, Reconciliation and Incident manage joint, uh, Management Joint Working uh, Document. 
the abstract describes the document as a joint working document to support the reconciliation service provided to Post Office Limited by Fujitsu Services. Uh, we can see the author is um, Penny Thomas, who you've described, and the distribution um, includes you. Can you see under the internal distribution? Yep. Were you part of the team who provided this service, uh, reconciliation and incident management? I don't remember the incident management side of it, but we were, I was a, a member of the, of the, the security operations team which, um, were, took on the reconciliation role. So you do remember providing reconciliation services? Correct. But not incident management? Is that right? Yeah, I think so, yes. And um, if we look, please, at um, page nine of the document, a description of what reconciliation is, end-to-end -end reconciliation within Horizon Online is the mechanism by which post office and post office account establish which transactions are complete and correct and which are not. An incomplete transaction is not necessarily a reconciliation error, but might become, it might become one um, if it is not completed in a timely manner. An incorrect transaction is a reconciliation error. Does that fairly describe um, what you understood yep. reconciliation to be? Correct. Each and every reconciliation error is the result of some system fault. That um, might, for example, be a software bug introduced through uh, design or coding, a system crash, or a telephone line being dug up. Such faults may affect transactions. Thus, it is the job of recon the reconciliation service to detect when and how any transaction is affected by any system fault. Yes. Does that fairly describe the nature of the bugs, crashes, or other faults that might re uh, require a reconciliation to occur? Yes. And when did you first become involved in reconciliation? I have no idea when we started doing that. Was there an equivalent service for Horizon, uh, Legacy Horizon? I have no idea. Or can you recall, was it only established in order to support Horizon Online? I have no idea. From at least this time onwards then, from um, at least... Um, uh, 2011, uh, you would have been aware that bugs, errors, and defects could cause imbalances uh, within the sub postmaster accounts. Discrepancies, yes? I wasn't aware that bugs and errors caused reconciliation. This says the fault might be yeah. a software yeah. bug. Yes. Why wouldn't you be aware that a software bug? could cause a reconciliation well, re error. Reading this, and I don't remember this document, um, if I'd read this at the time, um, yes, I would have no known that a, a bug would have, may have caused a reconciliation error. Did you read documents that were sent to you? Not every document. Why, why not? Because they were really... Uh, they were aimed at a certain distribution list. And we, we would receive documents to re review, loads of documents to review, and not any of them, not all of them would have been relevant to our role. Why were you being sent a document that wasn't relevant to you? Because it's, sometimes there's a scattergun approach on, on documentation. So this document that records that reconciliation errors might be the fault of Horizon software bugs is one that um, didn't make it into your conscience, is that right? I may have read this, I don't remember. Were you aware um, that um, software bugs within Horizons might cause reconciliation errors? I don't recall, I don't know. Well, when you were carrying out the task of reconciliation, did you ever think, hold on, it might be a software bug that's causing the error. We better look at that. 
No. So, so far as you were aware, you worked on the basis that Horizon had such integrity that no bugs within it, either introduced through design or coding errors, could cause reconciliation errors. Is that right? To an extent, yes, because uh, the reconciliation pro within the team was a process and it didn't involve the in investigative side of that uh, transaction or uh, an incomplete that needed reconciliation. Was your view the um, a commonly held one amongst your team, do you think, that reconciliation errors are not caused or could not be caused by Horizon software bugs? I, could, I honestly couldn't, couldn't tell you. Well, had you ever had a discussion with other members of the team? We've got a reconciliation error here. Let's think of the possible causes of it. Is it due to a telephone line being dug up? Is it due to a system crash or a power failure? Or is it due to a software bug? We better look at these alternatives. No, that wasn't part of the remit within the reconciliation team. Whose job was that? The SSE. It was their job to investigate, on your understanding, the yes. causes of the reconciliation error. Yeah. Did um, you ever read documents that, um, from the SSC that revealed that um, they considered that a software bug within Horizon might be the cause of a reconciliation error? I don't recall, no. Uh, can we look, please, at um, poll 3039193? Um, this is a record of um, a, an investigation report concerning a complaint made by um, Mr. Thomas. Um, give me a moment to catch up in my papers. As part of the complaint review and mediation um, scheme, and um, within it, if we just look at page four of the document, please, um, in the second box down, um, in the third paragraph, um, it's recorded that um, a witness statement provided by Andy Dunks of Fujitsu dated the 6th of April 2006 for the purposes of the criminal proceedings um, states that during the period 1st of November 2004 to the 30th of November 2005, he, that's you, reviewed 13 calls made to the Horizon um, Service Desk from uh, Garwin Post Office. His professional opinion was that, quote, none of these calls related to faults which, have had, which would have had an effect on the integrity of the information held on the system. Um, I'm dealing with things at a relatively high level at the moment. In the future, we'll come back and look at the detail here. That um, sentence, none of these calls related to faults which have had an effect on the integrity of the information held on the system, that was the, um, the standard line that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And was that the line that you took from um, your predecessor's witness statements? I believe so. I can't recall. We know that um, in relation to um, the ARQ data um, from uh, obtained in relation to Mr. Thomas's case, that there was um, it was a dip sample only, that it was checked only for evidence of zero transactions, and that the data was not checked for any bugs, errors, or defects. Um, was that a common approach that you would dip sample? 
I've got no idea what a dip sample was. So you would look at a period only, rather than the entirety of, um, for example, the period over which the um, sub-postmaster was accused of theft and false accounting? We would only have looked, I would have only have looked at what was requested from the post office. In the witness statement you provided to the inquiry, you have suggested that you had limited technical knowledge of the operation of Horizon and of any bugs, errors, or defects within it. Mm -hmm. How would you go about satisfying yourself that none of the calls, in this case, related to faults which would have had an effect on the integrity of the information held on the system? I would have done, as I said before, I would have con conducted due, my, my own due diligence of an investigation of, of that each and every call within its own merits. Did you intend by making a, a statement that included a line such as that to convey the impression that you had conducted an analysis of information exchanged in the calls and concluded that there was no question of any error, bug or defect within Horizon? I'm not quite sure of the qu what you're asking. To a person that's not familiar with the nature of the role that you were in fact performing. That statement, none of these calls related to faults which would have had an effect on the integrity of the information held on the system, might give the impression that you had co conducted an analysis of the information exchanged in the calls and reached the view that of the things mentioned, there could be no question of errors, bugs, or defects within Horizon. I still don't really understand the question. Well, let's take, um, let's look at it a different way. Um, can we turn up um, poll 403219? Um, poll four zero three two one nine. That would um, it can't be displayed. That would have been a um, a document setting out um, uh, the number of occasions on which um, you provided um, witness statements for um, uh, cases. Um, for a period between August 2004 and March 2005. How frequently do you think you provided witness statements? Hazarding a guess, it may have been one a month, one every two months. It was, from my recollection, it was very, very infrequent. Who else was providing witness statements? The only person that I can recall would have been Penny Thomas. I don't know prior to that or the person before me um, running ALQs, whether they did. When you made the witness statement, did you anticipate being required to attend court? No, I didn't. Were you ever called to court? Yes, I was. On how many occasions? Again, I can't remember. Half a dozen times. And were they spread around the country? Yeah, I can't remember every one. So about half a dozen, you think? Yeah, I think so, yes. Did you engage with um, uh, those that were conducting the prosecution, people from post office legal, before you gave evidence? 
I don't believe, I can't recall, I'm not saying, that, uh, uh, may have met them before at, at the court, at the case, at the court um, itself, but I don't recall that happening. At Were you given any advice or assistance on the proper limits of the evidence that you could give, whether you in particular were a witness of fact who was producing documents or an expert witness who was analysing what the documents showed? I wasn't told the limits of what I could give evidence-wise, no. It, my understanding was I was there to collaborate my witness statement to be true can we look please at poll 307 3280 This is an exhibit sheet um, to your witness statement prepared in the case of um, the post office against Lee Castleton, a civil claim. Uh, can you see that? Yes, I can. Uh, dated the 27th of September 2006. Mm -hmm. And it's your exhibit AD1. Yeah. If we just go over the page, please. And just expand it. Thank you. Uh, the, this is a call log, isn't it? Yes, it is. And if you just keep skipping, please, Frankie. Keep. And keep going. There's a series of call logs. Yes? Mm-hmm. Was it um, your practice always to exhibit the call logs in this way when you provided a witness statement for the purposes of legal proceedings? I can't remember. I can't actually remember supplying a witness statement, that witness statement with that call log in it. Can we look please at Fujitsu 3083726? And this is um, a summary of call logs prepared for the purposes of um, Jerry Hosey's uh, prosecution. If we just expand it so we can see the whole page. You can see that there's a breakdown at the top and then call reference details and an overview of each call is given in date order below. And then an example is given that the reference who the call was taken um, by, the resolution, and the outcome. And then if we go over the page, please. There's another one and another one and yep. another one. Was it your practice, uh, again, always to exhibit the call logs, as we've seen in the civil proceedings of Mr. Castleton, or to provide a summary analysis of the call logs, as we can see for Mr. Hosey's, uh, sorry, Jerry Hosey's prosecution. What you're asking, whether that it was standard, it, I would supply exactly what I was asked for from the post office. But when you were writing the witness statement, yeah. what, would you, what was your understanding of what you needed to do for the, the witness statement? Again, instruction from the post office, if they'd asked for a breakdown of the calls that were logged. But did you understand that you also needed to exhibit them, produce them? I don't recall that, no. That can come down, thank you. Did you know anything about um, the uh, contractual obligations placed on Fujitsu? as to the provision of um, evidence and data that was 
um, compliant with a legal standard? No, I wasn't aware, no. That if the contract existed as between post office and Fujitsu, which said when Fujitsu provides information for the purposes of a criminal prosecution, it's got to hit this mark, it's got to reach this standard. No, I never, I wasn't aware of anything like that. Were you provided with any training in relation to um, this aspect of your role, the provision of um, evidence in court proceedings against sub-postmasters and your obligations and duties to the court? There was no training on the um, production of witness statements. They were quite, it was quite straightforward, straightforward to understand what was required. Um, there was no specific training for attending court either, so. So I think that's a no. Yeah, that, 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 if that answers your question, yes, yeah. I'm thinking about um, somebody who provides opinion evidence, mm -hmm. analysis evidence. Mm -hmm. The steps that they ought to take to satisfy themselves as to the um, accuracy of what they're saying and also describing within uh, their evidence the steps that they have been taken. Was there any training or instruction or guidance or help on those issues? No, no. I would have used the standard template as before for producing the witness statements. And in all of the prosecutions where you gave evidence against sub-postmasters, did the template always say the same thing? There's nothing in the documents I've looked at that would affect the integrity of the data. No, they, ver they did vary over time. Did any of them say that the faults that were being reported did have an effect on the integrity of the information held on the system? No. They always said that it didn't. Uh, correct, yes. <laughs> Did you ever disclose anything about the um, ability of um, Fujitsu staff, including in the third line of support, um, remotely to access Horizon terminals without the knowledge of sub-postmasters? Did I what with, with that information? Yeah. Did you ever give any evidence about that? Evidence in court? Or? Yes. No. Evidence in witness statements? No. Did it ever occur to you that that might affect the ability, or that might affect the um, ability to say that there's nothing in the information I've looked at that would affect the integrity of information held within the system? No, not at all. The fact that there are people in Fujitsu who have access and can uh, change data at the terminal end mm -hmm. without the sub-postmaster's knowledge. I wasn't aware that was possible. Was that ever a topic of discussion? No. Can I turn back to the transaction reconciliation process? Uh, can we look, please, at um, Fujitsu 3080215? And uh, can we look at page 9, please? And... Um, We've looked at the first and second paragraphs under um, paragraph 1.1. Yes? Mm -hmm. We looked at those a moment ago. But was it your understanding that um, errors 
created as a result of software bugs were identified by the system itself. Was I what, sorry? Were you aware that any reconciliation errors caused as a result of software bugs? No, I wasn't. And that follows because you weren't aware of any software bugs or the possibility of software bugs. Is that I, right? No, sorry, I was aware of software bugs it, it, within the Horizon system. But not all of those, or any of them that I'm aware of, uh, with a result of a reconcili reconciliation error, I was not, did not believe or was aware that any of those bugs caused reconciliation issues. What were the causes of reconciliation um, errors then, um, if, as if they never included software bugs? Reconciliation, a reconciliation error is the breakdown of the transaction somewhere along the line. So it, it hadn't been completed, and that's what we dealt with. All of these were faults caused by the system, weren't they? Uh, the no, no, master. no, they, were, they weren't, no. Because, uh, I think it said before, it could have been caused by a power outage or, or a, a lo less loss of connectivity to the branch. These were the main causes for, that we, I was aware of, of um, reconciliation issues. So looking at that second paragraph again, under 1.1, um, where it says each and every reconciliation error is a result of some system fault, and then three examples are given. A software bug introduced through uh, either design or coding. The second one is a system crash. And the third one is a telephone line being dug up. You're only aware of the second and the third of them. Is that uh, right? Yes, I don't recall any um, reconciliation issues that resulted or the resolution was to do, to do with a, 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 bug, a software bug. So in the um, decade or more that you were performing this function, did you never hear any discussion that there might be something wrong with the system itself by way of um, uh, coding or design error? No. It was never mentioned? No, not no. Did you see um, the same problem coming back to you time and time again for a transaction correction to be made? For a reconciliation? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. The most common. There, there were a lot, number of common reasons. What were the common reasons? The common reasons were loss of connectivity to the branch. Do you remember a Computer Weekly article being discussed from 2009 onwards? No. I never read Computer Weekly. I'm not suggesting you read it. Yeah. Um, I'm asking um, whether you remember it being discussed within no. Fujitsu. No. Do you remember a campaign starting from about 2009 onwards? I, yes, I was aware of, of something going on, yes. And what was the something you were aware of going on? Um, would have been a postmaster's um, so how do you say it? were appealing or saying that, that, that they weren't at fault for the losses and it and was what were they saying was at fault the fidgets the horizon system and what was the discussion in the office about what they were saying I, I, I honestly can't remember if there was a discussion at all about about it. I was aware of it through probably press or whatever, but I don't recall having a conversation with anybody about it. Not, I'm not saying I didn't, but I don't recall one. You were producing witness statements to courts mm -hmm. around the country mm -hmm. saying, I'm, I've analysed the records of calls by these very same sub-postmasters of the help desk, yep. saying that they, on occasion... Um, 
there's an imbalance or a discrepancy, which I cannot explain. I believe it's the fault of the Horizon system. Was there no discussion in the office? Well, hold on. Is anyone looking into this? No. You just carried on providing the witness statements? In, my, in, in our area of, of the team, no. I don't think we did discuss it at all. Looking back, do you think it ought to have been the topic of some discussion? At a higher level, possibly. Whether that went on, I don't know. It wasn't for us to discuss or, or make judgment. You were the one that was going along to court or providing witness statements. Yep. It was your name at the bottom of the piece of paper that was signed, mm -hmm. saying this is true. Mm -hmm. I know I can be prosecuted, I think it would have said, mm -hmm. if I state in it, in it anything I know to be false. Yeah. Did you not think that was quite a serious undertaking you were engaged in? Yes, I did. Uh, you heard through the media and the like that the sub-postmasters were saying there are faults in the system, the horizon system, that are causing discrepancies for which I'm not responsible. You were providing witness statements at the same time saying there is nothing that I've seen in the documents I've examined that could explain a system-generated discrepancy. Well, as you just stated, I would have probably taken that as, as it's their, their, their opinion that there's something wrong. I wasn't aware there was something wrong, so I still believe my statements on the witness statements I gave were, were true at the time. Can we look, please, at Fujitsu 308 6882? And um, if we can just go to the last page, please. And then scroll up. Thank you. Um, it's an email chain um, to which you were copied. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yes. Of the 26th of January, 2010. Ernst & Young. Who did you understand Ernst & Young to be? Auditors. Uh, they're in the process of auditing the Royal Mail Group financial systems. Part of the audit includes systems that are managed by Fujitsu on behalf of the Royal Mail Group, particularly the Horizon and Credence uh, Polmy systems. When you read that, did you think, hold on, that's talking about Credence. I don't know what Credence is. No, I don't remember thinking that, no. Anyway. One area of the audit concerns user access and whether an individual should have continued access. Ernst & Young have identified a sample of users based upon the existence of the user in the ACE server database. Do you remember what the ACE server database was? No, I don't. And are requesting that confirmation uh, the user still requires access to Horizons and Credence. Each of you have been identified as the line manager for an individual or individuals included within the sample. Each user has accessed the system since January 2009. Please, um, can you please confirm if the users associated with your name are still employed by Fujitsu and if they require access to um, uh, Royal Mail Group systems as part of their um, uh, job role? And then please, um, if we go on to um, FUJ 308-6945. And scroll forwards. Um, this document is um, a 2011 uh, production by Ernst & Young, which raises issues about um, access to and the integrity of um, the Credence system. Can you remember getting this document? I No, I don't remember seeing this document. Can you remember, by reference to the previous email and to this mm -hmm. document, uh, whether concerns were raised by the auditors over the integrity of the system and access to it? Of, no, I, no, I wasn't made aware. 
Um, that can come down, thank you. You were uh, somebody who was responsible for the cryptographic crypt keys. Mm -hmm. And that was for the sub-postmasters. The counters. Yes. Yes. Uh, did uh, part of your role um, involve consideration of who was um, able to access within uh, Fujitsu the Horizon system? No, it wasn't. Uh, was that the responsibility of anyone within your team? No, not that I believe so, no. Were you responsible at a mechanical level for granting or removing access, as instructed, of um, Fujitsu employees? Not a mechanical level. I wouldn't. We wouldn't be. We, we wouldn't administer any the physical change. Was that not a function of anyone within your team? No. But can we look, please, at Fujitsu 308 3703? Can you see this is a witness statement um, signed by you? Mm -hmm. Just if we um, expand it um, a little bit, please. And just scroll over the page, and over the page, and over the page, and over the page, and keep going, keep going, keep going, and again, and again. Let's keep going. And that's the end. So go back to the beginning, please. You'll see this was a witness statement of the species that provided summaries mm -hmm. of call logs. Yes. Was that the normal way in which you did things? There was no normal way because it depended on what the request from the post office was. Would the post office specify, we want you in your witness statement either to or not to exhibit call logs? I can't remember spe specifically how it was requested. Or would they just ask you to provide a witness statement? Um, I can't remember, actually. Can you um, try and help us how you went about your task of deciding whether to summarise uh, records of um, calls, the help, help desk calls, or whether you exhibited them? When you say exhibited them, as in on the witness statement? They attached them, like, like we saw in the yeah. Arselton case. Whether the, uh, that was a request from the, the, the post office or not, I, I can't remember the, the process of, of how I was asked um, to exhibit them or... I vaguely remember them saying, can we have a list of calls or how many there were? And they may, I think, may have come back to me saying, oh, can you expand on this? I really cannot remember how that process worked. If we just look through um, your um, witness um, statement, please, in, in this case, um, this is for the Porters Avenue branch, Mr. Um, Jerry Hosey's case. Um, can we see that it's dated the 3rd of June 2008 and you say I've been employed by Fujitsu on the post office account since the 11th of March 2002 as an IT security analyst. Is that an accurate um, short description of your job, a security analyst? It was the title we had. Everybody, I believe everybody within that team was called an IT security analyst. Does it accurately describe your job? That your job Analyst, was, no. Why were you um, called something that didn't accurately describe what you did? That was the job title. An analyst um, might be understood to be somebody with technical expertise who would undertake a um, 
qualitative assessment of data? Mightn't they? It could be. How would you describe your job shortly? If you were to provide a job description that wasn't an IT security analyst? It's difficult to put it in words because although we were classed as an IT security team, a lot of the um, roles and jobs that we did didn't really fall into IT security. So it was a hard one uh, to describe our role. The way you describe it in your witness statement provided to mm -hmm. us for this inquiry you might describe yourself as an, um, an administrator, or is that being unfair to you? No, it's more, more than that. We'd, it, the role involved a lot of administrative and procedural work, but there's more to it than that at, at times. In any event, uh, you say, I have a working knowledge of the computer system known as um, Horizon. How did you gain that working knowledge? Through experience of working on the account uh, and that furthered by speaking to having conversations and my uh, interaction with uh, other um, account <coughs> members, the SSC, support teams. Did you ever undergo the training that uh, sub postmasters underwent on the operation of the system? I did once, I think many years ago, I can't remember the date, I think Penny and I went and did a half day or a day's course, and I can't remember where that was. You continue, I'm authorised by Fujitsu to undertake extractions of audit data um, held on the Horizon system. Why was it called audit data? Wasn't it just data? I don't know why it was called audit data. Why did you call it audit data? Because that's what it was referred to as. It was the audit system, so it's audit data. And to obtain information regarding system transaction information processed on the Horizon system. I make um, uh, this witness statement from facts within my own knowledge unless otherwise stated. In the witness statement, do you state otherwise, i.e. that you have made it from information that's not within your knowledge? No, because when I made the statement, my knowledge was enough to make that statement. So for the purpose of making this witness statement, you didn't speak to anyone else? No, I, prob no, I probably did. That line suggests that um, when you go through what you're about to say, you're going to identify if you have spoken to anyone else or have obtained information from anyone else, mm -hmm. i.e. matters that are not within your own knowledge. And in the um, pages of the statement um, that follow, the 13 pages of it, mm -hmm. take it from me, you don't identify that you've spoken to anyone else. But, but within my due diligence, my knowledge I'd undertook um, for each call, my knowledge was then sufficed to make a, 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 that, this statement. You continue, any records to which I refer in my statement form part of the records relating to the business of Fujitsu. These were compiled during the ordinary course of business from information supplied by persons who have or may reasonably suppo be supposed to have personal knowledge of the matter dealt with in the information supplied, but are unlikely to have any recollection of the information or cannot be traced, since the nature of the help desk involves many engineers at all, different, all at differing levels, and any number could be involved in, any, in a particular call. As part of my duties, I have access to these records, but I was not involved with any of the technical aspects of these calls. This area is not my particular area of expertise, and I make this statement simply to clarify, sorry, simply to help clarify the call logs for the benefit of the court. Was that paragraph essentially standard wording? Yes. Uh, from where did you obtain it? 
from the standard witness statement or previous witness statements? Um, from your predecessor? Yes, sir. yeah. Uh, you continue at the foot of the page. An important element of the support provided to sub-postmasters and counter-clerks is the Horizon System Help Desk, HSH. The HSH is uh, the Horizon user's first port of call in the event of their experiencing a problem with the Horizon system or requiring advice and guidance if the system were to malfunction. Upon discovery, the Horizon users, either sub-postmaster or counterclerk, would raise a call to the HSH seeking clarification or advice. HSH is a service run by Fujitsu for the post office. I've been asked uh, to provide details um, and information on the calls for advice and guidance logged by HSH uh, recorded during the period 1st of September 2005 to the 29th of uh, November 2006 for the Porters Avenue branch. A report outlining each call was created and I produced the resultant CD as your exhibit APD1. Uh, this CD was sent to the Post Office Investigation Section by special delivery on the 19th of February 2007. And then this, I've reviewed the HSH calls pertaining to the Porters Avenue branch during that period. There were 33 calls from the branch to HSH, and all the calls are of a routine nature and do not fall outside the normal parameter, working parameters of the system, and in my opinion, would have had no effect on any counter um, uh, discrepancies. What does routine nature and do not fall outside the normal working parameters of the system mean? My understanding uh, of that statement is they there were, weren't extraordinary calls. There, a lot of the calls were of a routine. I says routine. I keep saying routine. Was um, expected or, or common faults or common calls to the help desk. So you would describe a, um, calls of a routine nature, meaning ones that were made frequently? Yes. What about the substance of the call? If the sub-postmaster was saying there is a discrepancy for which the system is responsible that I cannot explain, and a number of them were saying that time and time again, would that be a routine call or a call of a routine nature? I don't recall seeing calls or that said that, that I um, had a look at. Um, but you could call them a routine call, yes. You continue, in my opinion, would have had no effect on any counter discrepancies. What steps would you take to satisfy yourself that the substance of the calls had would have had no effect on any counter discrepancies? I would have based that statement on um, my due diligence and the steps I, I, I mentioned earlier. Looking back now, do you think you were technically qualified to make that statement? Well, yes, I do. Why? Because I'd gained enough knowledge of that, those particular calls from the appropriate people to satisfy myself that, to make that statement. So that's all I'll ask for the moment. Thank you. Uh, we've reached one o'clock. Um, there is, um, in fact, still uh, more for me to do. Yeah. But maybe we can do that on a yeah. future occasion. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably right, uh, Mr. Beer. Mr. Dunks, it's inevitable, I think, that you will be asked to return to give further evidence. Yep. Um, and there may be yet many more questions to come. So um, you've been notified in due course when that will be, and you'll be given, I hope, significant notice of that so that it doesn't disrupt your life unduly. All right, we'll break off until tomorrow now. 10 o'clock tomorrow, sir. Thank you very much.